a hospital suddenly stops offering specialized care to save heart attack victims kind of took a bit of a break. By definition, it is a 24-7 facility. This is sort of like saying the emergency room is closed. A Colorado celebrates the release of his family held hostage by Hamas. A state representative figured out one of the dumbest, most offensive things you could say about the crisis in the Middle East, and then he said it. And how about some news that isn't terrible? My good news is that most of the family is here. I have good health and we're enjoying the day. Next wraps the week as we have for 352 weeks running with the happiest headlines in your life, no matter what's dominating the news. Tonight on Next. There are hospitals that promise specialized treatment for the worst kind of heart attacks. They keep teams on call 24-7 to save lives, which is why it's odd. The Swedish Medical Center decided to just kind of take a little break from offering that life-saving care. Our Cole Sullivan asked why. With heart attacks, cardiologists have a mantra, time is muscle. Every single minute counts when it comes to STEMI care. Dr. Pyle Coley says STEMI, the worst kind of heart attack, have one superior treatment that must happen fast. Her fellow cardiologists insert a catheter and expand a bubble to unblock the artery. And the cath lab is where these surgeries happen, where patients have their arteries opened during these potentially fatal types of heart attacks. She says cath labs are standard at hospitals across Denver, but at Swedish Medical Center in Inglewood, the cath lab closed last weekend. The hospital confirms it had, quote, planned operational downtime scheduled. A cath lab should not close. By definition, it is a 24-7 facility. This is sort of like saying the emergency room is closed. A Swedish spokesperson says the hospital hasn't had any delays or diversions. Quote, we have operational downtimes and do extensive preparation, including notifying appropriate stakeholders stakeholders like ambulance providers. Denver Health says its paramedics know about the issue at Swedish and follow normal procedures to bring impacted patients to other hospitals instead. It just makes me really mad, Cole, honestly. Swedish is an accredited chest pain center with a special designation, which according to the American College of Cardiology means it has cath lab staff available 24-7 every day of the year, no listed downtime exception. This hospital really risks losing their accreditation because of what they're doing. But more than accreditation, she worries about patients. You know, as a cardiologist, I'm shocked and I'm aghast that there are cath labs in my own city that are having planned downtime. We asked Swedish many more questions, like why and how often its cath lab is closed. All the spokesperson would say is that the lab is currently open and hospitals prepare for scheduled downtime. I spoke to two different Denver hospitals today that each told me their cath labs don't have scheduled downtime. And Dr. Coley says her colleagues told her a closure like this is exceedingly rare, and you can understand why, Kyle. Yeah, I, I mean, as, as Dr. Coley kind of likened it to with an ER, if I'm rushing to an ER, I'm not thinking I should pick up the phone and ask if they're open. Exactly. And if you show up in these cases, Dr. Coley says, and it's closed, mm -hmm. you have to go to a different emergency room. And as she said, time is muscle. Yep. They want to get this procedure done as fast as possible. Really interesting. Cole Sullivan, thank you. The first hostages released by the Palestinian militant group Hamas are Americans. It's a mother and a daughter with connections to Colorado. Hamas says that Judith Reynan and her daughter Natalie Reynan were released for humanitarian reasons. This afternoon, the Israeli government shared an image of Judith and Natalie being escorted by Israeli soldiers. Apologize, we don't have that image for you. The Biden administration says the women are now in Israel for a medical checkup before they're reunited with family. Judith and Natalie live in the Chicago area. They hold dual American-Israeli citizenship. Ben Reynan, Natalie's brother, Jewish stepson, lives here in Denver. Earlier this week, he told us that Judith and Natalie were visiting Israel when Hamas attacked. Family last heard from them via text two weeks ago. They said they heard gunshots and explosions and had barricaded themselves inside the home where they were staying. Ben says the family's been in constant contact with the American and Israeli authorities and never gave up hope. We received some uh, information from a neighbor who had, had, you know, peered out and seen them being taken at, at gunpoint by Hamas. Um, and that's the last we have seen from them or heard from them. And I'm looking forward to going on this journey of recovery when she's eventually returned um, back to the United States and, and being for her for whatever she needs for this very traumatic event. Judith and Natalie are the first Hamas hostages released of the estimated 200 people abducted from Israel on October 7th. Ben says he's looking forward to celebrating Natalie's 18th birthday with her. That's on Monday. 
A Republican state representative in Colorado says Israeli Jews under attack should turn to Jesus to be saved. And Lord, use this. Jesus, use this as an opportunity for people to reach out to you. For the Jewish people to realize that you are the, you're the, the Savior, the Redeemer. You're the one that, that gives us the peace of the Holy Spirit. That is Representative Scott Bottoms, who is also a pastor in Colorado Springs. He prayed for peace during that live stream church service recently, also added that the war could encourage Jewish people to find Jesus. Bottoms kept digging, also questioning whether the Israeli and U.S. governments knew about the Hamas attacks ahead of time, whether this conflict is a sign of the coming rapture. Scott Levin, head of the Anti-Defamation League in Colorado, offered Representative Bottoms this lesson in religious studies and basic human decency. To think that this would be the time to ask or to proselytize to Jews, I just think is wholly inappropriate. We Jews pray for the coming of the Messiah, so it's sort of a defining belief as Jews that we do not yet believe that the Messiah has come. So if one were to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, that would not make them Jewish, that would make them Christian. Representative Bottoms has a history of making himself a a Bottoms when it comes to comments related to the Jewish community. Earlier this year, he likened abortion to the Holocaust. He's also said that medical debates over abortion procedures were, quote, similar to the Nuremberg trials. Jim Jordan's bid for House Speaker is totally bucked at this point. So Jordan's giving up after Colorado's Ken Buck and others blocked him on four consecutive floor votes. Jordan kept losing more and more Republican votes in these public tallies. So House Republicans held a closed-door vote where a large majority told Jordan to just give it up already. The House can't function without a speaker. It can't pass legislation to, say, back Israel or support Ukraine. So Republicans are going to meet on Monday, and they're going to hear from a slew of potential speaker nominees for the next go-round. Establishment Republicans are fuming at the small far-right faction that threw out former Speaker Kevin McCarthy and kicked off this mess. But now Colorado's representative in that group is buck-pedaling to put some distance between himself and those others. When they united behind Jordan today... Congressman Buck of Colorado cast protest votes for a more moderate option. Today, the other seven rebels put forward a compromise trying to salvage Jordan for speaker. And only Buck refused to be a part of it. So I got a preschooler at home. You often find yourself saying the same thing over and over again to a preschooler. Voters are faced with a ballot question about preschool that also seems pretty repetitive. Proposition II on your November ballot deals with money for universal pre-K. Guy Marshall Zellinger explains why you're being asked twice for the same money. Universal Preschool. Voters in 2020 approved a ballot issue that funded the program that started this year. When Proposition EE passed, taxes increased for cigarettes and other tobacco products, and Colorado created a new tax on nicotine products, like vape pens. That tax revenue pays for Universal Preschool. Proposition II on your ballot this year is related to that. Proposition II, if approved, would allow the state to keep and spend $23.65 million in tax revenue. Greg Sabetsky is the chief economist for Legislative Council staff. Basically, he does complicated math for lawmakers. Complicated math is why Proposition II is on your ballot. It's the same taxes that voters approved in 2020 when they passed Proposition EE. Sabetsky and Legislative Council staff provide the details that end up in the Blue Book. In 2020, that Blue Book underestimated how much nicotine taxes would generate in the first year. We built an estimate that actually we thought was fairly conservative. Um, It ended up being too low, and that's the reason for the excess. And because the state took in more money than voters were told, 21 and a half million more, the state cannot keep it, plus another two million in interest, unless voters say yes one more time. If voters say no, the money and the interest have to be refunded to cigarette, tobacco, and nicotine wholesalers, and the higher tax rate approved three years ago will have to be reduced 11.5% moving forward, so the state will stop collecting more than the voters were shown in that 2020 blue book. Because the idea is, well, if we were off by 11.5% in year one, we'd also be off by 11.5% in year two and year three, etc. Bottom line, a yes vote lets the state keep money voters previously said yes to in 2020. It's just more than the state expected. A no vote means the state cannot keep above what was estimated and will have to reduce the cigarette, tobacco, and nicotine tax moving forward. 
So if the blue book is always an estimate anyway, why not provide voters a really high estimate just in case so they don't have to be asked the same thing twice for the same money, basically? Sibetsky told me their office is responsible for providing an accurate estimate. But if lawmakers, the ones who approve the blue book language before it gets printed, want to overinflate the numbers, that's a decision they could make. Uh, complete transparency. I said to Marshall while his story was running there, I don't know blank about this. Uh, but that's kind of the point. Like, there hasn't been a public conversation about Prop II because we're in an off year election and it's not even the most talked about thing on the ballot. So a lot of people are going to be going into it blind. Yeah, and I, right. But, and, and this is why the confusion is like, I thought I voted on this already. I found out there's at least one other time where voters were asked, hey, we underestimated something you already said yes to, so here it is again with the over. And that passed. Uh, this may be just the second time we've ever had to be asked something like this. And it seems just, you know, move on. Yeah. But we got HH on the ballot, so that's huge. Well, thank you for teaching me some blank about Prop II. Uh, so Prop HH, that's the big one. Marshall's going to moderate our Prop HH debate next Monday. This is the big property tax measure that also impacts your Tabor tax refunds. Governor Polis will be on the team arguing in favor of Prop HH. Against it are some Republicans who oppose the plan. Live debate presented along with our partners at the Denver Gazette on Monday, October 23rd at 7 p.m. We will stream it live on 9 News Plus and on 9news.com. If you miss it, you can watch it later on 9news.com or the 9 News YouTube channel. Another Colorado admits to being part of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. My good news, my good news. Well, as of right now, it's, what is it, October 20th? And that man had a cat on him. He did not appear to know. Mid-October, temps in the 80s, we're going to head outdoors to enjoy the weather and enjoy your answers to our favorite Friday question. Another one of the dozen Coloradans who stormed the Capitol on January 6th is pleading guilty to a felony. This time, it's a guy from Telluride accused of punching a Capitol police officer in the face. The FBI arrested Avery, Avery McCracken in December 2021. Prosecutors say he went to Washington on January 6, 2021 to protest. Then he joined the crowd inside the West Plaza of the Capitol, and that is where he assaulted two officers. The FBI says McCracken will plead guilty to one count of obstructing law enforcement. He'll be sentenced in February. The FBI says at least 14 Coloradans are among the 1,100 people arrested on charges related to the insurrection. A weather record that stood for nearly three quarters of a century is history today. Temperatures at Denver hit 86 degrees at DIA, three degrees past the record of 83 set in 1950. Inspired our meteorologist po poet Corey Reppenhagen to bring a little heat of his own. Corey Reppenhagen is on the weather beat. Time for first white streets, an October trick instead, late tropical treats. That was Corey Reppenhagen on the weather beat. <laughs> it's the, it's the, at the end that, that gets me, Lauren. That's, that's what I'm here for. Yes, and I love the snapping in the background, yeah, you know. Yeah. He's, he's a, you, you named it correctly, he's a meteorologist poet. He's one of a kind. More than what I can do. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. Don't sell yourself short. You don't have to do this in haiku or iambic pentameter or anything else. How about just the weather? Yes, yes. Yeah. Just that. I mean, I can barely do it just without trying to be a, a poet. But we have a live look outside over downtown Denver. The sun is slowly starting to set in the background of a record-breaking hot day. Temperatures still pretty warm for 615 in the evening. We're at 74 degrees at DIA. Light winds coming in from the east-northeast at around 9 miles per hour. But speaking more about the, temper uh, the record that we broke today, we did make it to 86 degrees, which is well above our usual high this time of year, closer to 63 degrees, but it did break our existing record of 83 degrees set on this day in 1950. And as you can tell, for the month, we are very dry. We're about a half inch to three quarters of an inch shy to where we should be this time of year. But for the year, we're about five inches up. So not too bad right now in Denver. As you take a look at our HD Doppler radar, we are nice and dry. We're watching those drought conditions slowly push their way back into the western slope in the southwestern corner of the state. But the front range in eastern Plains remains drought free. Overnight, we're going to be pretty mild and calm. Clear skies, overnight lows near 45 degrees. We'll see those highs in the middle to upper 70s tomorrow. Sunny skies, upper 70s actually sticks around through the entire weekend and into our Monday. Now, we are going to watch for some change to finally push in on Tuesday. We're going to see a weak cold front push in, and that's going to drop our temperatures closer to seasonal numbers where we should be this time of year. We're also going to watch for some light mountain snow. I think the front range in eastern plains will likely stay dry. And we'll start to rebound as we go through the second half of the week. Thank you, Lauren. What's good? 
You tell us, right? Because we can say that this or that is news, but then we carve out time each Friday for whatever is the most important headline in your life. That's next. Always wanted to put next on a hillside like the big S over Salida. Hey, good news is in the air and in the trees, the leaves on a beautiful, if unusually warm, fall day. So we took our favorite end of the week question to Wash Park. My good news today is I got to come to the park, got to enjoy some scenery, got a nice day, got to bring some fresh air. I love this time of year. Our good news is we have two new little ones that joined our group. My good news is I am here visiting a, a really good friend and I'm playing with her dog and I'm able to relax and kind of be outside of a big city. Today is a beautiful day, my favorite season. My good news is a family visitor. It's, uh, I am so happy because my family is with uh, two men. Yeah, he looks really relaxed. We've actually become pretty good friends. That's we cool. are celebrating my great-grandma's 99th birthday today. I've never ridden in a limousine either. My good news is bringing my cat with me. My good news is that we're here celebrating my great-grandma's 99th birthday and that we get to do that in a limo for her first time ever in a limousine. And my good news is that uh, most of the family is here. I have good health and we're enjoying the day. A viewer texted in tonight's next question after a road trip from Santa Fe to Denver. They passed a lot of interstate signs showing the distance to Denver and wondered, Denver's a big city. Is that the distance to the city limits, the middle of the city? What? That's actually a pretty interesting question. CDOT says that federal regulations require that the distances on those interstate signs be based off the distance to the center of a city or town. Not the exact geographical center, but some major intersection or government building that's near the center of town. CDOT says for Denver, that point has historically been Broadway and Colfax. Makes sense if you think about it. It's the outer edges of the city that tend to change over time, not, not the center. Apparently using county lines for that measurement's out of the question because you annex something, move something, just changes too frequently. That is pretty cool. Hey, so is this. Cole Sullivan bringing in feedback. Pinch hitting. I owe you a beer for that. I'm serious. You know I'm good for that. Your feedback is next. Contrasting feedback tonight on our story about the Hart Cath Lab at Swedish suddenly closing down for some downtime. Megan says, infuriated to hear about that happening. It makes me scared for the future of medicine. Patients come first. Michael, though, said today's story about the Cath Lab at Swedish was not up to par. There was no information about the why. That's fair, Michael. That's the reason why we repeatedly asked Swedish to talk about that, and we wish that they had responded. Paul writes in about us pointing out Republican Representative Scott Bottoms suggesting that uh, Jews under fire in Israel should be praying to Jesus. He said, the time is not now. Elizabeth notes, this is America. You can pray when you want. You absolutely can. But if it's that tacky and that public, we might talk about it on Next. <laughs> 